Good morning to everyone. Today, the topic is how do we repair broken relationships with our children? Today, it's more and more common, unfortunately, to find that there is a separation. Sometimes the separation is only physical, but sometimes it's intellectual. We don't think the same way. But sometimes the rupture is more difficult, it's emotional. How do we deal with this? Last week we spoke about why are children so entitled in this generation. This week I'd like to deal a little with why and how, I'm sorry, how to be able to repair broken relationships. Now, first of all, what is a broken relationship? In order to have a broken relationship, you need to have a relationship and then you need to be able to break it. Every single parent gives, invests, does the best for their children. I have no doubt. The majority of parents do that and they do it with all their heart. They really invest themselves. And the amount of sacrifice, self-sacrifice, the amount of giving that goes on is tremendous. But unfortunately, it never seems to be enough for a lot of children. You didn't give me this. This one gives me this. I see what others have. What is exactly, what is a parent supposed to give a child? In the education process, what are we responsible for exactly? Because if it was up to our children, it seems that we are responsible for anything and everything at any time in any given situation. But it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, for many parents, they believe that giving is the solution to making a relationship work. It's not true. I'd like to share with you a story that happened in one of the cities, I think Ashkelon in Israel, many, many years ago. There were two neighbors. They were now in their 70s. And one of them needed a transplant of a of a kidney a kidney transplant both families were observant and what happened is that the father that needed that kidney transplant the kids were fighting on who is going to have the merit to give the kidney to the father. It was so bad, the fight between the kids on who's going to give the kidney to the father, that they went to court, to rabbinical court. At the end, I don't know how they ruled, but the father, you can imagine the type of nachas, the type of 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 uh, of pleasure that a parent has that my kids are fighting on who's going to give me a kidney the father was recuperating from the uh, from the from the uh, uh, the operation and he was thinking in his head, I don't understand it. I just don't get it. I've always said no to my kids. My neighbor has always said yes to his kids. What's the story of the neighbor? The neighbor, it was before Sukkot, the neighbor comes to his neighbor, this person that had the transplant maybe years before, and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have the strength to build a sukkah. None of my kids worry about the fact that I can't build a sukkah this year. 
You think somebody's going to call me, is going to pay attention to me? What happened? This neighbor that had the transplant heard this. He called the son of his neighbor, told him, Jack, if I gave you a hundred dollars, would you build a sukkah for somebody? He said, yeah, sure. Why not? I can make a buck. He says, your father needs a sukkah. I'll pay you. A few days passed. Unbeknownst, this happened unbeknownst to the neighbor. The neighbor calls the person that had the transplant and tells him, it's okay. <laughs> My son called me, believe it or not. He is going to build a sukkah for me. Now this father, which lived the moment where the children are fighting to give them his kid, to give him a kidney. They're fighting, who's going to give him? He says, I don't understand. I've been so hard with my kids. I've always told them no. When they want something, they had to work for it. They had to earn it. My neighbor, which always said yes, that's what this, this is what he gets. He's 70 years old. None of his kids care to go and help him and, and maybe see what his situation is. What's happening over here? So he asked his kids. And the kids said, Daddy, when you said no, we understood that it's for our good. We understood that inside of you, it was hard for you to say no. And you saw it be upset. You saw us fight you. But we knew deep down inside. We knew deep down inside. That everything that you did. You did because you cared for us. Giving. Is not. A translation of caring. Sometimes not giving <clears throat> is a translation of caring. When I'm able to say no to a child and say, you know what, I love you, but I can't be a part of this. I'm going to give you an example. I have Hashem four daughters. So one of my daughters one day did a bat mitzvah. And she wanted things to be exactly like what her friends are doing. So she wanted us to spend another $2,000 on this and, and uh, another $1,000 on something else. I says, why? Because my friends want. So it's true that at that moment we could just fight it and shut her emotions and make sh sh shame her. That's not what we did. We tried that, to ask her a question and ask her exactly how does she define herself? What defines her personality? What makes her different? What does she do for her as a person? And we tried to reinforce this. Many times the big problem of relationship is that the way we speak to our kids and sometimes to our spouses as well is that we label them with the situation i'm going to give you an example i come into my son or daughter's room and i say to them you are so disorganized you're a schlump this you are a messy the child is going to think, yes, this is the way I'm seen by my father or mother. And there's a lot of emotion, a lot of an animosity in the tone of my voice, in my facial expressions. I'm a good for nothing. It would have been better if I wasn't born. Now you're going to say, I've heard this from kids. You're going to say, what do you mean? What did I say already? We have to disassociate the person from the situation. You don't say to a child, you are messy, you're a schlump, basically you're good for nothing. No. 
You say to a child, my child, I don't understand. What does it mean, I don't understand? I feel, do not use the word you. The word you goes and pokes at someone. You have to say, I feel. I feel that you're a great person. But I don't understand how an organized, intelligent, beautiful young lady, a, a, a smart young man like yourself can live in such a messy, disorganized room. It's not fitting. I want to tell you that when I, at the beginning of my uh, parenthood, it would happen sometimes I would hit my kids. It happened. And one day, my eight-year-old did something and I was about to give him that spanking and something switched in my mind. I said, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. So I approached my child and I just told the child, I don't understand how such a beautiful, wonderful boy like you could do such a, a foolish thing in school. It's not at your standard. What happened? My child started crying. And now, I just didn't get it. I asked him, I don't understand. All the times that I hit you, you never cried. And now you're crying. He says, now you really touched the soft point. You really, you really hurt me. A child naturally wants to look as if he is the best in front of his parent. Unfortunately, when we have many kids, when we have many worries, when we may have many different types of challenges in Parnassah, in Shalom Bayit, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we are overwhelmed with so many things from the morning to the night. And we do our best. We do our best as being parents. We don't, but we don't take the time. We don't take the time to be able not to label the child and say, you are this, you are that, you are chutzpah, you are. And what happens is by doing that, instead of lifting our children, our child feels that they're nothing in our eyes. So now I'm going to look for attention. I see that when I do negative stuff, you give me attention, I'm gonna do more negative stuff. They invest themselves where the energy is. They feel that they're not understood. In this week's Torah portion, there's a discussion like this between father and son, between God and the Jewish people. God is about to give the Ten Commandments after he expressed, he expressed the Ten Commandments. And the Jewish people miscalculate the coming of Moses. He's six hours late. We need a leader. We are hyper. What do they do? They create a golden calf. At that moment, Moses, when he comes down, he breaks the tablets. Why does he break the tablets? Now she explains that to say, basically, God, they never got your Ten Commandments, so you can't really blame them. But afterwards, there's an exchange between God and, 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 and Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu goes and says, God, forgive them. 
He says, you know what? I'm sick and tired. I, I, I've had it. I'm going to erase this nation and I'm going to make you into a new nation. Moses said, absolutely not. You do that, erase me from your book. I want nothing to do. I want nothing for myself. And then God comes with an argument and says, you know what? I'm going to send you an angel that will accompany the Jewish people and take care of their needs. But leave me out of the picture. They don't want me. Why in the world should I invest myself? And to this, imagine for a second, you have a father that's the CEO of a company and the child works for the father and he makes or whatever the child doesn't work for the father. And he makes a big mistake with his father. And the father tells him, my son, from now on, speak to my assistant. I don't want to hear from you ever again. Just speak to my assistant. Don't get anything you want, but speak to my assistant. At that moment, what does a father want to hear? Yes, daddy, I'm going to speak to your assistant. That would be the biggest slap in the face you can give a father. That would be the most painful answer you can give a father. So Moshe Rabbeinu, when God tells them, I'm going to send an angel, he doesn't settle for that. He says, absolutely not. We want you. This is what needed to happen. What needed to happen is that even though there was a broken relationship, you did something which is terrible. You accepted another God. You accepted another father, another mother. You went to worship idols. I should be upset and completely, I don't want nothing to do with you. But God is saying, how much do you want me? In other words, I'm not going to judge you by your actions. I am going to connect with you at a core, at an quintessential level. How do you make amends? How do you connect? First of all, you have to be humble. I want to tell you that children of today, adolescents, especially teenagers, besides the incredible peer pressure they go through, which is a thousandfold whatever we lived in our time before the cell phone era. So if anybody here is uh, over 20, they didn't live the same peer pressure. But these children, you have to understand that till the age of 25, the upper brain right, is not fully developed. And therefore, if they act in a, in a way that's chutzpah, when you start pointing and say, oh, this is chutzpah, and this is chutzpah, and this is chutzpah, they don't know what chutzpah is. What are you talking about? Tell them how you feel. Stop pointing fingers at them. Lift up the good that's inside of them. Give it importance. Invest yourself in bringing this out, be sensitive to what they're going through. That's what a child, a child wants to be validated. So I'd like to teach you for a second a little exercise. An exercise in communication in general, and certainly could be very, very good with our children as well. Do you remember when one day your child started pulling you and saying, Daddy, Mommy, we're going to the mall, right? And you were on your phone and you said, yeah. And they insisted, they asked you again. And they asked you again. And then you told the little child, yes, Joey, we're going to the mall. And then they left you alone. What happened over there? What happened is that that child understood that when you made that motion with the head and you said yes, you didn't mean it. 
the moment that you repeated my words and you said, yes, we are going to the mall, you gave me validation, you understood me, you grasped what I said, and now I trust that what you're saying is true. One of the things we need to do in our conversation is to stop being on the defensive. It's not because you're on edge in your personal life that your child does not need to be respected. This week I had a conversation with someone and he didn't understand. What do you mean my teen has to be respected? He's my child. She's my child. I'm older than him. In this day and age, I want to tell you it does not work. Teens today do not respect authority the way they, they I'm sorry, they don't have the reverence for authority the way they did before, even if it's a parent. In order to be able to have the respect of your child, you're going to have to speak to them respectfully. You're going to have to be able to validate and mirror what they're saying. Seek to understand more than to be understood. Which means that when your child, you feel that there's something wrong, go out with that child. Spend that moment where you say, I want to understand where you're coming from. But what I would do before that is make that exercise by yourself. It takes investment. You've invested so much, it's time to continue investing as well. Make the investment of thinking what exactly, why is my child going through this right now? Why is my child acting this way? What is the pain that they have? What is the needs that they have? They're allowed to have needs. Do you know that the restrictions that a child has are, according to a doctor, 10 times more restrictions than what inmates in jail have? So basically, every single one of my movements needs to be in accordance with what my mother thinks and what my father thinks. I already have that at school all day. In business, I have to follow certain rules. The big problem is that we micromanage our children and we think that these independent beings are under our control. They are our possessions. The Torah teaches us concerning marriage. Man will leave his father and mother to attach himself to his wife and become one flesh. I want to tell you that I know many couples which are married for years and the parents' grip is still not letting them be free. And they suffer like this for years. I'm not talking about two years, 10 years, 15 years. And they're not fully able to build their home. A part of being a parent and making amends with a child and repairing the broken relationship is not to look at what doesn't fit your mold what doesn't fit your frame in the way they speak, the way they dress. Your job at that moment is to give them love, to show them that you care for them in such a way to be so attached and show them so much love without pinpointing any type of issue that bothers you. It's very difficult because that's not the way we were brought up and to focus on one and one thing. You are my son, you are my daughter, 
do you always be my son always be my daughter i don't love you because you did this and that and you i don't and you didn't do this or didn't do that i love you because you're my child that's what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling God. The Jewish people might have, they, they served idols, but they love you. Don't judge them by their actions. They're a part of you, a part of you is in them. That's what the child wants to hear. He wants to feel that you unconditionally love them. And I want to tell you all the problems on the spectrum today and believe me, there's so many problems. All the traumas and everything else can be healed with unconditional love. I'm not here to scream at you, raise my voice. That's one of the worst things because we, as parents, appear as these worst monsters that I can't relate to. Who wants to? be seen by their child in such a vile way. Who wants to be criticized all the time for every single thing you do wrong? To make amends with your child, you need to be able to say, you know what, my son, you know what, my daughter? I've made mistakes. Your life is your life. Of course, there are different stages in life. But disrespecting a child, an adolescent, is basically breaking a relationship. Respecting your child. This is what the Mishnah says it. Who is honored and respected? The one that respects the creations. Even though they're your children, you have to respect them. There was a rabbi in London that used to hit his kids. And he wrote to the rabbi that he, you know, he grew up when he was a kid getting a spanking, right? And in London, you get a spanking for what you did wrong, right? And in many other countries, you get a spanking. So he didn't know what to do. So the rabbi asked him, when other kids misbehave, do you raise your hand on them? He said, no, absolutely not. He said, why? Because they're not my kids. He says, these kids too are not your kids. These are the kids that God lent you, hopefully, for a long time in good, year, good health, with a lot of nachat. And if you meditate and contemplate on that, that you're just here to be the facilitator not to be the owner of your child, not to be the one that's going to say and impose and it has to be like this, and if it's not, then we have a whole crisis in the house. So, the way to make amends and the way to be able to bring back the relationship is to really make a 180 degree 180 degree turn shift a quantum shift in your mind you look at the child for who he is he is your child that's number one and that's really a hundred percent of what it is all the rest that child eats by himself drinks by himself walks by himself is able to thank God I'm talking about later years again because that's really when the friction starts. They might not dress the way you want. They chose their way. From that way, you have to pray. Pray that they go the right path. But there's two things in education. There's self-investment and ego involvement. Ego involvement means that this doesn't fit my style of life, so you have to change. Self-investment means that I've given you the tools. I want you to grow and make the right decisions. I trust you. I don't threaten you. I don't put you down. I trust you. 
I believe in you. There were one day, a successful man told me that he doesn't understand. He does so much for his father, which is now retired. And his sibling does nothing for him. The sibling is so appreciated by the father. And the one that does so much for the parents is not appreciated. Why? So I asked him, imagine that your father is teaching two of his children how to bike. And one is biking and saying, Daddy, look at me. Daddy, look at me. Daddy, look at me. And the other one says, Bye, Daddy. And he goes with us. Where is he going to have more nachat? A parent naturally has more nachat from somebody which is independent. On the other hand, there are children which are hypersensitive and very seem to be very needy in how much they need. You have to be able to respect and calculate this. When you see a child that needs your love, give him your love. Give them your love. When you see a child that needs their space, give them their space. Even the letters of the Torah, in order to be kosher, there needs to be space between every letter. So my encouragement to you, and to leave you with a very practical tool today. A. Speak respectfully to your child. B. Stop judging your child and expressing judgment. C. Love them because they're your child and give them unconditional love even if it doesn't fit you. D. Validate their emotions. Ask them questions. Seek to understand instead of being understood. Try this for 10 days. Even if you're not, there's no rift between you and your child. And see how the child, seeing their parent look at them in a way which is with such appreciation and such love and dedication, how the child is going to be able to flourish and to grow. God bless you all. Shabbat shalom. May Mashiach reveal himself right now. Amen.